Welcome in, Hokies fans, to this edition of the Tech Sideline Podcast. We record on Monday, September 26, and we've had a few extra days, but now it's time to look back at the loss to West Virginia on Thursday night in Lane Stadium. On episode 257 of the Tech Sideline Podcast, we'll look back at some of the most important m- moments of the battle for the Black Diamond Trophy, look back at what went wrong for the Hokies and how they can build off this heading into one of the tougher stretches of the season, and at the end, we'll also look around the ACC as a whole. All of that and much more coming up on episode 257 of the Tech Sideline Podcast, which starts right now. Welcome you into episode 257 of the Tech Sideline Podcast. However you are listening or if you are watching on YouTube, we ask you to like, comment, subscribe, and turn notifications on so you know when we go live with a podcast every single week. Also, if you are watching live, make sure to drop a comment or question for David and Chris, and we'll get to those with Katie at the end of the show. Before we get started, want to remind you that Tech Sideline is presented by First Bank and Trust Company, one of the nation's leading community banks. First Bank and Trust is a nationally ranked community-focused bank with over 30 locations throughout Virginia and Northeast Tennessee, with an additional presence in North Carolina. They offer free checking with industry-leading mobile banking, financing solutions for personal agriculture, business, commercial, and mortgage needs, and more. Visit www.firstbank.com to learn more. Let's introduce everybody on set today across the way. David Cunningham, Managing Editor for Tech Sideline, is on here as we recap West Virginia. As always, to my right, lead analyst and columnist, Chris Coleman in the red shirt chair in the fourth chair today it's Katie Adams and behind the scenes Will Stewart again filling in admirably as our greatest podcast producer in the land but he is as always our founder and general manager and I'm Jake Lyman your host let's dive into this guys Uh, obviously we were hoping for a happier podcast hoping it was going to be three straight wins for Virginia Tech And, and it looked close early on as Tech took the lead late into the first half but just was all West Virginia in the second half I want to start here looking back at some of the more important moments of the game because it felt like there were a few just turning points where it could have gone one way or the other and it ended up going the West Virginia Mountaineers way. Uh, And let's start with that third and fourth and one for the Hokies right after Jalen Stroman punched out the football. Dorian Strong fell on it. Tech could have gone up 10 to 3, 14 to 3, but no gain on back to back runs. What was your thoughts here, Chris, on the play calls there? And do you think Tech could have gotten a little more creative to try and get that yard? Uh, I love Sean King, but I don't think he's the guy on a third and one dive to go head to head with a linebacker. Um, like I, I think, you know, Holston's not the tackle breaker that, that King is, but he's more likely to be able to probably lean forward and get a yard in that situation. Um, just on based on pure body mass. The fourth down call, I mean, I went back and watched it yesterday. Tech sent Jesse Hansen pulling from left to right, and they were running Grant Wells. But center, right guard, right tackle all got shoved two to three yards in the backfield, just physically destroyed at the line of scrimmage. So Hansen ran into him because they were in his path. So Grant Wells not only had to contend with all the West Virginia defenders coming at him, but he had to contend with a bunch of offensive linemen <laughs> push back into him as well. It just blew up from the start. There's not a play in the playbook right now that I would trust. Well, there's not a running play in the playbook right now that I would trust Virginia Tech to execute successfully in a short yardage situation right now. So if you're going to go for it, Pass. do something short on the yeah. edge, uh, I think. Find something like that uh, because this running, I mean, you couldn't, they couldn't pick one up against Wofford. And now they run. I mean, West Virginia's strength of their defense is their defensive line. And Virginia Tech's weakness on offense is it's run blocking. And generally, you don't want to attack the other team's strength with your weakness. Yeah, well, and Wells admitted after the game that it was a, it was a draw. Like, it was a run all the way. It wasn't even an option. Um, you know, I think, I think it's important that that first down play, I think um, – I have not gone back and watched it, but Keyshawn King almost picked up the first down and he was just barely short. Um, And I was listening to Mike Burnup and Bill Roth on the call and Bill had said from what his angle looked like that Keyshawn King, if he had put it in his other hand and literally just 
gone a little bit farther, he would have picked up the first down. But then Tech gets in this short yarded situation and can't convert. I'm not surprised at all, considering that's just that was just like the the tip of the iceberg in terms of the running game woes. I mean, 35 total yards uh, uh, on the ground. That kind of just goes to show you how abysmal this offense in the run game is. Um, you know, and I don't think it's necessarily a bad play call if you have the personnel to do it. But Tech does not have the personnel to pick up a, a short yardage run situation. You know, in that case, either run a jet sweep or, you know, throw a slant or, you know, hope for your, hope your wide receivers can get separation or something. It, you know, make it so West Virginia has to stress. But too many times, I think that that's one example of too many times in this game, Tech just played right into West Virginia's hands, and West Virginia knew exactly what – the Hokies were going to do. Yeah, and I don't think it's important to stress that even if Virginia Tech had made that first down, that was no guarantee they were going to score a touchdown. We know this team struggles as they get closer to the to the end zone when the field compresses and you need to have more dominant run blocking and you need more playmakers. It seems like Virginia Tech's best chance to score a touchdown is from like outside the 25-yard line yeah. where there's more space. And we're going to touch more on the struggles in the running game later on in the show. Uh, but do you think that if they had picked that up, you're, you're probably thinking you're at least going to get three out of it at that point. Do you think that maybe changes the way the rest of the game goes? I know West Virginia dominated later on, but the momentum was all going the Hokies' way after that fumble recovery. I don't think it would have changed anything. I, I think anybody hanging on to that, like, it, yes, there were some swing plays. I mean, you can talk, we'll talk about more of them later, but like in the end, West Virginia dominated the line of scrimmage. Yeah. And I felt like if Virginia Tech had won the game while getting completely thrashed at the line of scrimmage, it would have been fool's gold. So I think West Virginia earned the win. And is it possible that some crazy things could have happened and Tech could have won? Yeah. But even if that had happened, we're still sitting here today talking about the same issues that, unless they're fixed, will still will ultimately cost this team more games. Yeah, I agree. And even if Tech had gotten three more points, the Tech still – loses by what 20 I mean <laughs> like I think it got down to the point at the end of the game where where Tech was just so one-dimensional it didn't matter um you know Tech's defense I thought was okay but but when West Virginia West Virginia continue, continued to set the tone at the line of scrimmage and Tech Tech couldn't get a push against Boston College you couldn't get a push against Walford against the best defensive front it's played it couldn't get a push against West Virginia and you know, that's why they had to put it in the air so many times. And as Grant Wells told me after the game, you know, when you're one dimensional, it's easy to defend. And and that's, you know, I, I don't think getting that fourth down would have really changed the fact that Tech was one dimensional the rest of the game. Well, Tech still led up until, I want to say, 17 seconds left in the first half. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about that drive to go down the field for West Virginia. The defense looked really good early on, especially first drive, get a three and out. You force a turnover. Uh, but then West Virginia, after only scoring three points on their first four drives, went down and scored on five straight possessions. And that one that right at the end of the half to go down and get that long touchdown to Sam James, it felt like that was the one that kind of opened the floodgates for West Virginia and allowed them to pull away uh you know in their previous drive they had gone on a really long drive and kicked a field goal right yep. where they basically had to drive the length of the field and the tech defense was was out there for a long time on that drive and then virginia tech gets the ball back and they immediately start snapping it with 30 seconds left on the play clock and then they called one of their own timeouts because i know tech is trying to score and everything yeah but basically only about 30 to 40 seconds came off the game clock in between West Virginia possessions. Like West Virginia, to me, never should have got that football back. I know Tech was playing to score, but sometimes you have to play to win the football game. And when you're playing against a team that has a more dynamic offense than you, if you turn that into a game where there's going to be a bunch of plays, that gives that other team the advantage because the more plays they're going to run, the the better their chances are of beating you. You have to you have to you have to keep that game as far as number of plays for both teams, around 60 or something like that. Um, so I just thought it was Tech got the ball back right there leading, and they did not think about how to use the offense to protect their defense, which was tired at that point because they'd just been on the field. Now, if West Virginia had gone three and out and Tech had gotten the ball back, that's totally different yeah. because you've got the momentum and your defense isn't tired. They don't need a breather. But Tech just 
the, the hand of the ball over to uh, quickly to West Virginia. They didn't force West Virginia to use their last timeout, which they could have done if, if the Hokies hadn't used their own timeout. Or heck, maybe West Virginia would have been content to let it go into the half if if if, if they had had to burn their last timeout on defense. I don't know. But you had a chance to run clock there. And I think when you're playing, you have to understand who you are as a football team and who you're playing. And the more plays that are run when in a Virginia Tech game this year, the more likely they are to lose because they can't score and – and West Virginia can, and North Carolina can. Um, so I just I thought that was like not so good from a game management strategy point, that strategy standpoint. That's something you have to think about. And for all I know, you know Brent Pry is the head coach, but he's basically also the defensive play caller. So maybe he's already at least part of his brain is already thinking ahead. Okay, if West Virginia gets the ball back, what am I going to go do defensively? Like I don't know if he's completely thinking about it from a strategic standpoint. So that's something that like he's either going to have to get better at as far as doing two things at one time, which I think is really difficult, or at some point, you know, somebody else is going to have to call de- defensive plays so he can actually focus on the game management aspect of things. But uh, it's, some, it's, certain, it's something to keep an eye on. But I, to me, like, I, I, Virginia Tech should have gone into halftime with a 7-6 to six lead. That, that, that was what that's I didn't talk about it in my article, but like at some point you have to stop writing. But uh, I, I didn't I didn't think that was like I get everybody wants to be aggressive. Like if Fuente had done that, everybody would be pissed. But that's how Fuente beat North Carolina last yeah. year, a team that had more firepower than Virginia Tech. You have to keep their plays down because the more plays they run, the more likely they're going to score. You can't hold a team like that down for 76 plays. You got to keep him in the fifties or sixties, and your game plan has to revolve around that. Yeah, the fact that West Virginia had a, a nine-play, forty-yard drive that they kicked their field goal, um, their second field goal of the game, that took up three minutes and fourteen seconds, and then Tech comes out and has the ball for forty-nine total seconds, runs five plays, and kicks it right back. Right, and then West Virginia gets the ball with. It, one minute and one second to go. What and, a timeout, right? Uh, yeah, and yeah. cranks out, you know, a, a six-play, 70-yard drive in 50 seconds and scores. And I thought that the touchdown was a good play call. I mean, they, it was just a, a slot receiver right up the seam. They threw the ball. D- Daniels placed it right over Dax's head, um, you know, and it was just kind of a mismatch. Um, but, yeah, when you're in that situation you – know, the Clemson game in 2020, if you guys exactly. remember that. Perfect. Yeah. I mean, it didn't, it, it didn't, it didn't work, it didn't, but, yeah. but that was tech was in the game in the fourth quarter because of that. Yeah. If you remember that game, Virginia tech and Justin Fuente, they came out with the offensive game plan where we are just going to slow the game down. We are going to run the play clock down to like five seconds before he snapped the ball every single time. And Clemson had the ball for less time even if Virginia Tech did go three and out the fact that Tech you know Tech ran five plays but took a timeout in there and there was like an incompletion or two in there like the clock barely ran and all of a sudden you give the ball back and you know yes West Virginia got the with the West Virginia got the ball back out you know right after halftime too Mm -hmm. so I think it can be better from a game management standpoint but yeah Tech just that's kind of like the last thing you want to do is West Virginia just kicked the field goal. The last thing you want to do is give them the ball back right before half. Even if you don't score, run the clock out, get to half. You're time. winning. Or punt it away and, and get, give it to them where you're going. You, you want to go into halftime with the lead. And, and I think, you know, tech, West Virginia scored 10 points in like a minute and 39 seconds because Tech gave them the ball back. Right, and if Tech had an explosive offense where you know there was a reasonable chance to score, that'd be one thing. But at this point, it's obvious that they don't. Like the chances of them scoring on that drive or any other drive, quite frankly, is not very high. Yeah. So you got to play the percentages there. And Hokies went into the half down thirteen seven, but again, it says thirty three to ten on the scoreboard, but. Heading into the fourth quarter, it was 16-10. Tech still kind of felt like they were in the Mm -hmm. game. Here's the last big important moment that I wrote down. Uh, Fourth and five. It was fourth and inches. Then it was a delay game or false start. Moved them back five yards. And 
Dax gets called for a roughing the passer penalty on an incomplete pass. Uh, Again, Tech would have gotten the ball back down six and weren't really moving the ball very well, but would have had a really good shot to go down the field or at least keep it closer. Had but an opportunity. From, from then on out, it was all West Virginia after that play happened. After that play, and then later on the drive of what was it, third and 14 when Pollard? It was got, third got and 14, hands illegal hands yep. to the face. Right. Yeah, those were like the 12th and 13th right. penalties of uh, the game. And, the, and then there, there, there were two other plays before that, I think, back to back plays when Wells throws the deep ball and he puts it right in between the two players two West Virginia defenders, and it bounces off Jaden Blue's face mask. This is a guy who called over 90 passes for 1,000 yards at Temple, and now he puts on a Virginia Tech uniform, and the ball's just bouncing off his face mask. Sometimes I do think Tech is offensively cursed. Um, and then the very next play, Tech punted. That was a third down play, which would have kept the chains moving and given Tech the ball in West Virginia territory, but instead they punted. West Virginia muffs the punt like on their own 20-yard line. Tech falls on top of the ball and somehow doesn't come up with it, and it goes out of bounds, and West Virginia keeps the ball. So those are two more. Um, but the penalties, yeah, again, 15 penalties. Yeah. Um, it, well, it got to the point where, like that right there, West Vir- you know, Tech just bailed West Virginia out twice. And yeah. if you, you get that, that fourth down stop, and you can argue whether or not Dax is – that that uh, that penalty was actually <clears throat> roughing the passer. I think it was it was close, but either way, that's one of your six captains. You can't have him committing one of those penalties, and then the guy who committed the next penalty, Narell Pollard, is another one of your captains. An illegal hands to the face. I, I counted after the game. Tech had fifteen penalties, ten different penalties right. after the game. Yeah, like um, football is more than just about X's and O's. You have to know your opponents. And by that, I mean the officials, too. That was a Big 12 crew. It's the same Big 12 crew that called the Alabama-Texas game when Alabama was called for 15 penalties. Yeah. In that conference, they favor offense. They're, they're, they're going to call penalties on defense if it's close because that's the brand of that conference. So you've got to know that going into the game. Like, football's not just about, oh, we're going to call this play, this is our strategy on that. Like, you have to know all the little things. Because, yeah. I mean, that's that can be the difference in one or two games every year. It's just getting the little tiny details right and the things that people don't even think about. And, uh, you know, Tech's not doing that right now, I don't think. Um, I don't have a problem with any of the calls. They, they, they were they were bang, bang plays. Yep. But, you, but, again, Big 12 officials are going to make that those calls, and you have to know that going into the game. Alabama found out the hard way, but Alabama had the talent to compensate for it. Um, Virginia Tech does not. Virginia Tech has to do everything right in terms of, of little things like that to have a chance to win. Yeah, and this is, again, this isn't the first time Tech's been undisciplined this year. I mean, this is the same team that had 15 penalties at Old Dominion. So that's twice in four games when it didn't happen for the previous 17 years at all. Yeah, and and 15 penalties is the second most all, like in program history. And that's happened twice now in four games. Once every two weeks. <laughs> 132 yards, too. I believe that's the second most in, in program history as well. And West Virginia had eight, got eight first downs by penalty, which is the most in program history uh, by an opponent against Virginia Tech. So, so all sorts of records out there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, it, you know, when, when some of those penalties were like, there's the delay of game penalty that, that followed a false start. And just oh yeah, that's just, an, that's another one. Just all right, so you, you've got to know. Stuff. All right, so the beginning of that possession, you know, it's a forty-second play clock, but then after the penalty, it's only a twenty-five-second play clock, and it's like nobody for Tech realized it. Nobody knew the rules that it was going to be a twenty-five-second clock then, so they didn't get the play in until there was like nine or ten seconds left, and Wells has to go through a couple of checks to get into the right play at that point. So it's like nobody knew in advance that it was going to. Dropped to 25 seconds, so they were late getting the play in. And then nobody was actually looking at the clock to see that it started yeah. at 25 seconds. So that's twice now in four games where nobody from Virginia Tech is looking at a, a clock that's running. Yeah. And they're taken by surprise when a clock is running. Just like silly game management errors. And, yes, it's a young staff who, you know, Tyler Bowen's up in the booth, and he's the <laughs> offensive coordinator. But how many graduate assistants, how many – how many people helping out with the program? How many support staff members do you have down on the field to make sure the time management things don't happen? The defensive, uh, the the thing right before the half, you know, giving calling a timeout, giving West Virginia the ball back. That's more in Brent Pry's hands. Um, but but just the back to back penalties, a false start, and then a delay of game, just just silly things that 
are easy, easily fixable. And, and do you think that with this happening twice now in four games, could we see the trend of being undisciplined continue? And then would you think that maybe is a problem with this staff? Or do we think this is correctable and it's just some some early season issues for a, a staff that really hasn't had experience at this level yet? I was talking to a former player last week, and, and this was, it was Thursday. And it was Thursday morning, so before the game. And we were talking about penalties, and uh, and I told him, and he used to t- he 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 brought something up about oh yeah I remember those penalty runs we had to do, you know in practice after every penalty we picked up in a game, and I'm like oh yeah they don't do they don't punish for penalties anymore, yeah. and like he was like what Price said that, so that, that used, comes, Price right. said that after the old Dominion, so, so like that was that was part of the pro it was instilled in the program that was part of if you committed penalties you were being punished, uh, that doesn't happen now. So yeah, that might be something that that he'll have to take a look at yeah. at some point. All right, well, we have a lot more to talk about with West Virginia, but first let's check in with Katie in the fourth chair for the first time. Um, y'all alluded to it a, a second ago with the penalties, but just wanted to note this stat that Scott Glessner put in the, stat, put in the chat. He said the last time Virginia Tech had multiple games of 100 plus yards in penalties was 2004. It happened three <laughs> times that year, and surprisingly, all three were Virginia Tech wins. So, unfortunately, we don't have the same luck <laughs> this year since we're losing with that. Well, but. you know, we had a, some future NFL players on offense, and we had a top five defense that year. <laughs> so, you could overcome things like, like that back then. Um, and then, second of all, I went down to Knoxville this weekend to take in a little SEC football um, since Virginia Tech didn't have a game on Saturday, of course. So, it was interesting to see all the Hendon Hooker jerseys, all the Hendon Hooker signs at College Game Day. Of course, you know, the wonderful performance he had <clears> on Saturday. But then the more interesting thing, I was driving home listening to a podcast and they were talking about just the, the transfer portal in general. And they said, the transfer portal is interesting because you can go in and get a quarterback that'll solve a lot of your problems and can really transform a team. Or you can go in and get a quarterback and kind of miss, and it doesn't change the trajectory of your program. And they were like, a perfect example of this is Grant Wells at Virginia Tech. <laughs> and I was just like, wow. I mean, the fact that it's it's food for thought that the public is saying things like that. And it sucks because, you know, we have him for years to come, and so I hope that we don't end up with a sour taste in our mouth with him at quarterback. But. Well, he's still a projectable player. Yeah. yeah. I, and, I, think the big... like, I think any quarterback would tell you that, We'll go over some running stats for Virginia Tech later. Yes. Yeah. But uh, when you've got I mean, the Tech's passing game operation is brand new. Like you expected there to be some setbacks early on there. I think they're actually a little bit further ahead than I thought that they would be when you consider the fact that they have no help at all from their running game. And they're in so many long yardage situations. I mean, if you want to help the passing game, then, then you have a, I mean, I'd rather them throw it on fourth and one than throw it on third and eight. Yeah. This is what Grant Wells said to the media after the game. West Virginia was a good team, and you can't beat them being one-dimensional. Like I've said before, the run game opens up the pass game. When you're one-dimensional, it's very easy to defend. And I think that is the root of all Virginia Tech's problems right now. The fact that there's no run game whatsoever. Because, to Katie's point, Grant Wells is a pretty... He's an average, above-average quarterback. You can even say he's pretty good he's got a really good arm i know that he he's a talented guy and when the wide receivers are getting separation like he's he, you know that Jaden blue Oof. pass Jaden yeah. blue should, should have caught like he's putting the ball a lot of times in the right spots but when virginia tech has to throw the ball and gets in these third and long situations every single drive because the running game doesn't pick up more than a yard JT Daniels had a great quote leading into the game. Uh, he was talking about Tech's third down defense, and he said, you can't live in third and long. And he threw out a great stat um, that, like, something – I think he said last year in third and eight or longer, teams only converted 18% of the time. Yeah. You can't live in third and long. Yep. You have to be able to run the football. You have to do well in, in short yards. And that's where Tech's living right now. And and, and that's and that's the problem. And – Again, like people are people are saying, oh, hey, well, you know, why why can't why, why is Keyshawn King not a good running back, or why is Grant Wells not a good quarterback? And it's like, well, I, I think the problem lies up front, where you know we we saw Keyshawn King break off a sixty-five yard touchdown against Boston College, and granted, it's Boston College, but 
when the hole is there, you know, when Grant Wells has time, I think the pass protection has been pretty good. Been I mean, okay, you saw yeah. the the touchdown pass from from Wells to Caleb Smith against West Virginia. Yep. He, Grant Wells had all the time in the world. But the problem is when you are such a one-dimensional offense, when the defense can drop eight guys and only rush three, which West Virginia did for most of the game, it, you, it makes you easy to defend. And this is, this is what Virginia Tech is in. And until they figure out, what the the run game situation defenses can literally do the same thing every single game yeah i mean when you've got some sometimes seven and eight defenders back there in coverage just clogging up those passing zones i mean it's a, it's a question of math four or five receivers or eligible receivers versus seven or eight defenders it's it's, it's not I mean, it's, we're, tech is easy to game plan for right now because you don't have to, you don't have to do anything exotic to stop the running game. You don't have to give them any funny looks. You don't have to say, "Oh man, we really need to walk a safety up late or something like that to throw them off." You can play it as base as you want it, and they're not going to be able to run the football against you. And I think the the only even though Grant Wells' stats weren't great, I don't think you can put the game on him no. on Thursday night. However, there were two big plays that maybe got lost in the in the mix of everything. Two overthrows from him that probably would have been touchdowns. I believe one was Daywan Lofton uh, heading towards the south end zone, and then Christian Moss uh, wide open heading towards the uh, the north Ma- end zone. Moss was the big one that was yeah. right in front of me. I was in section three, but again, like uh, this was probably the one time in the game where the pass protection for Tech did break down. Yeah, and that first because that never... first play Wells got rocked by two guys. It wasn't. Right. They just actually one. got penalized for that. Yeah, for, for the, for it was a rough. It was a rough in the past, and, and that actually set up a gave them a first down, and then eventually it was the fourth and one where they didn't yes, score. Correct. So, so they were a little bit fortunate to be in that situation. But yeah, he couldn't he couldn't really set set his feet and step into that throw. He just winged it because he had to get rid of it, and he's got a good arm, so it overthrew it instead of underthrowing it. But uh, <laughs> the good side on that play was like Christian Moss was wide open running behind the defense. Yeah, that's it. So if you can get protection on that play, that's a touchdown. Um, and I, I will throw this out there. It's a slightly off topic, but you know we ran we ran Christian Moss's numbers last week, and five of the twelve. All right, so he caught five passes on twelve passing plays that he was in the game for last week against Wofford. Well, this week he caught two passes on the twelve passing plays he was in the game and was running wide open on the third. Yeah. So uh, you're actually getting a pretty high percentage of success from Christian Moss. And when you play the percentages, like I think he's the most projectable Virginia Tech wide receiver long term, and you're getting good production per snap from him right now, yeah. probably needs to play more. All right, well, thank you, Katie, for that. It allowed us to get into the passing game a little bit, uh, and I want to move to the running game now. Uh, we, we've oh, kind of God. been teasing it uh, that we're going to talk about some running game stats. Uh, West Virginia won the battle on the ground handily, over 200 yards rushing for the Mountaineers. 35 for the Hokies, uh, and 24 of those came on two carries. Jalen Holston had a 15-yard run. Grant Wells had a nine-yard run. So 16 carries for 11 yards outside of those. Uh, Chris, I know you have a lot to say about this. I do. <laughs> I, I do. So Tech's run blocking grade per PFF this year. And this is, isn't – don't just say offensive line. This is a team thing because the tight ends aren't blocking either. Um, so their run blocking grade this year is a 46, which is 63rd out of 65 Power 5 teams. Tech is seven-tenths of a point from being dead last. Who's worst? Arizona worst. and somebody else. Or maybe Arizona State. Tech, I don't I, Tech's lost in the ACC. Yeah, oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Boston College but, isn't even that bad. L- last year, Tech was 74.8 in run blocking, number 24 out of 65 teams. The year before that, Tech was 78.3 in run blocking, which was 13th out of 65 teams. The year before that, despite starting three freshmen on the offensive line right next to each other, two of which were true freshmen, they were still a 58.8, number 45 out of 65, which isn't great, but it's pretty darn great for starting three freshmen next Better to each other. Better than this year. So, yeah, I mean, this is like historically horrible. This is like Newsom-esque, if you want to go back to to, to those days. Um and the individual performances, and again, it's not just the offensive line. Johnny Jordan has dropped from a 66.6 to a 56.5. Caden Moore has dropped from a 71.3 to a 54.1. Silas Janzi has dropped from a 67.8 to a 58.9. Parker Clements has dropped from a 75.0 to a 44.5. He, Almost he, 30 points. He's dropped from, fresh, he's dropped from freshman All-American level to, like, 
probably one of the lowest grading offensive linemen in the country. Uh, Drake Dulius has dropped from a 69.1 to a 39.7. Nick Gallo has dropped from a 57.8 to a 37.6. All right, again, if it was just one or two guys whose play had regressed, you could say, ah, just, just a couple guys that maybe aren't fits for the new system or maybe they're just having trouble. It's everybody. All six of those returning players that played a lot of snaps for Virginia Tech, they have just gotten... It's not Well, it's unfair to say maybe that they've gotten worse. I don't know people are talking about the talent level, but if these six guys aren't talented, explain how they blocked well last year. Yeah. Oh, and the one guy you didn't mention is Jesse Hansen. Who, well, well, I didn't mention him because he didn't play Because he didn't play last, last year. year. But he's graded out. Well, he's clipped, he's he's I think he's, he's on the same level as the other guys. Basically, yeah. maybe you could argue that he's been the, the be- first be- or second best lineman. Yeah, which isn't saying much, and, but and so this is where I struggle. I I'm very confused as somebody who covers the team full time, and you know we asked Brent Pry after the game, and you and I talked about this over the weekend. We asked Brent Pry what was going on with the running game, and he straight up said, "You know, I'm not really sure," and. And you ask Silas, we asked Silas Janzi after the game, what's going on with the run game? And he said, I just do what I'm told. You know, I, I wish we, he's like, I wish we ran the ball more. And he said that because I think he feels like he's doing his job up front and he wants to give Tech a chance. But, mm. but at, at what point, at what point does, I mean, clearly it's not working. At, mm. at what point does it become so bad that like, what, what point is too bad, right? At what point, what's the point does Joe, like, do you change the scheme? Do you change what you were trying to do? Because clearly, it's not just if it was just Parker Clements or if it was just Johnny Jordan, it'd be one thing. Yeah. But the fact that the entire offensive line is struggling, the entire offensive line cannot block. And Tex played four games. If if it looks like it's not going to improve, which is what it looks like right now, exactly. Wh- why are you going to continue to try to teach it? I under I understand from a coaching perspective if you were trying to. For the future, you're a first time head coach at, or first time position coach at this school. You are trying to nail down this scheme and say, This is the way we're going to teach it going forward, mm-hmm. which might be great for a guy like Xavier Chaplin, a, a true freshman, or all the other younger guys in the program. But there are a lot of, I don't, I, I mean, I, I would say they're veterans because they've played a lot of snaps and they graded out pretty well in the past. Why all of a sudden? all of them not playing well. And are you going to continue to do that? Because if you continue to do that, it's going to be the same product every single week. And I didn't expect them to be like as good as last year's group and certainly yeah. not 2020's group. But as I said, each one of these returning players did a nice job for Tech in the past. And now they're just doing the opposite of a good job. Um, I didn't expect them to rank 24th or 13th in run blocking or anything like that. But I did also... They should not be arguably the worst power five offensive line in the country either. And and it doesn't seem like this is going to be something that the impending return of Malachi Thomas is going to fix. Oh, all the Malachi (laughs) Thomases in the world would not have helped the other night. I mean, those guys were getting hit as soon as they, as soon as they touched the football. You know, and it's interesting. I think Chris and I had this conversation the other day, you know, Katie mentioned Hendon Hooker. I don't think Hendon Hooker would help this offense at all. Well, it's he not help, but it, I mean, <laughs> he wouldn't be the Hendon Hooker that people yes. are used to seeing on sports. Yeah, I mean, it's not. Yeah. It's yeah. not like like yes, he would be an. You could say he might. He would be an improvement, but it's not like a quarterback or a dynamic quarterback or a dynamic wide receiver or a dynamic wide receiver would change this. It all comes down to the offensive line. And when, again, West Virginia can sit back and, I mean, they pretty much rushed only three guys the entire second half. And that's where Grant Wells' interception, the pick six, came from, where Grant Wells is throwing into traffic. And because there are eight guys dropping back, and there, there's nowhere to go. And, and when, when Grant Wells is under pressure, when West Virginia is rushing three guys— and then Tech can't run the ball. I mean, it all adds up. And again, at what point is it too bad where where they 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 make a change? And what change do you make when you make a change? Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I wish I knew. <laughs> I don't. I don't think they know either. And I mean, it'd be one thing if you're like, okay, this is our weakness, so let's just do that less. And here's our strength, and let's do that more. 
There is no strength. There's not like one type of running play that has been successful this year. They've all been complete failures. So where do where do you go? The crazy part is how okay or above average the pass blocking has been. I, again, like it's not like that has been really really bad. As we said earlier, Grant Wells has had time a lot of the time. Yes, it's broken down here or there, but but the run blocking has just been atrocious. Yeah, and I you you don't know how to fix it. Um, you hope that it's that it is a schematic change. Now, I, I do agree that, certainly agree that every time there's a schematic change up front and you're asking to, asking your players to play a new style of football, there's an adjustment period. Um, but it doesn't make any sense that, like, every single player is struggling. Yeah. You're telling me every single player can't execute this? Uh, it, so, I, and, if I, you, and if you go through a scheme change, can it, it, can it really get worse? Right. Um I, my worry, and and this, I'm not saying this is a definite for sure, but it's just something to think about. Is my worry is probably something that I pointed out before the season is that you've got a new offensive coordinator in Tyler Bowen. You've also got former offensive coordinators who are now running game coordinator and Joe Rudolph, passing game coordinator coordinator and Brad Glenn. Those guys come from different backgrounds in coaching, and they have new philosophy. They have their own unique philosophies and 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 schemes and ideas and things like that and we said before the season at least I said I didn't know what the Virginia Tech offense was going to look like because of all those new guys and I thought that might give Tech an advantage early because opponents weren't going to know what to expect but my concern is that there are too many chefs in the kitchen and not enough cooks and that maybe I'm okay with Tech's passing game concepts it seems fine to me um, maybe the execution of it could could use work but I'm fine with the concepts I, my my worry is that Rudolph is running coordinator and Bowen as offensive coordinator just isn't meshing as well as 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 they hoped it would as they thought it would and I'm not saying that's a definite um, but it's it's something I've got my eye on right now and that's going to be something Tech has to figure out if they can't get the run game going it's going to be a long season for this offense uh, the defense that looked really good. Early in the season, struggled on Thursday night, and we're going to talk about that in the second half. But before we take a break, let's check in with Katie one more time in the fourth chair. Circling back to the offensive struggles, last week we said, you know, they need to score 30 points to stay in this game and win this game. Now they're averaging around 20 points per game. I looked at the scores last year, and they only scored above 30 points twice, and it was against Middle Tennessee and against Syracuse. So obviously it's still an issue. Um, I'm going to kind of rephrase my question because I was going to ask, like, if you went – what three players from other teams would you go out and get right now to change this offense? But now it's like, would they all be offensive linemen? Now that yeah. I hear y'all talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Since but, you but, say a quarterback can't change it, you know, a good wide receiver I, can't necessarily change it. Like, yeah. what would I mean, we good, even need? Like, a, a, a better quarterback would help, sure. But, like, you're also not thinking about this year. You're yeah. also projecting the future. Too and like Grant Wells is still going to be here in two years, and he's a projectable player. Yeah. If everybody gets around, gets better around him, and he gets good coaching, he's going to improve. If he doesn't improve over the next two years, then that's an indictment on coaching, is it not? Yeah. So, uh, I, yeah, I personally three linemen, three linemen that we know are fits for what Rudolph wants to do. I how guess. about a, how about a, a Doug Nestor or a Brian Hudson? <laughs> um, so no, Doug, 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 Doug Nestor had his third best grading game <laughs> yeah, of I his knew, career yeah. on Thursday night, oh my God. Beh- yeah. behind twenty twenty games against uh, North Carolina and Liberty. Yeah, I, I just I don't. And to me, like I don't know if you brought in three new offensive linemen, would wh- how would they do in, in the scheme? Right, because you know we've seen. Every That's player what I mean. take you a step see, back. You've seen so is this is is what they're trying to do is what the is, is what this offensive staff is this amalgamation of different styles. Is it just not? Is it the system or the scheme or what they've come up with? Has the potion they've brewed is it just broken? And I don't know. I don't know. I I, I think I watched the. Uh, the condensed version of the game yesterday, unfortunately. And uh, obviously, Tech hardly didn't run the ball very much in this game at all. So, and the con- condensed version doesn't show every play. So, I got a very limited sample size of running plays. And, you know, I saw one play, the offensive line just get physically dominated and pushed into the, into the backfield, the fourth and one play. I saw another play where 
I thought Tech had a numbers advantage on the left side of the line of scrimmage, and it was a run over there. And all of a sudden, you saw two Virginia Tech offensive linemen over here chasing one guy, and the guy that they didn't block come free. So it's like they're not even picking up. They don't know what to do on those plays. So, like, there's not, like, one answer here. Um, all you can do is just hope it gets better. It should get better this week against North Carolina, but on paper it should have gotten better against West Virginia because they got smoked by Pitt and Kansas. At least their defense did. Yeah. And then they looked well, like the should have gotten 86. better against Wofford. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then it looked who lost again this week. Uh, <laughs> um, they uh, score? Uh, I think whoever they – they did. They did. They scored 22, but they gave up 24 uh, to an FCS team. Close game, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, one of the while we're on the the topic of offensive line, I, I I told Chris this the other day, when we were at ACC Media Days in Charlotte, and I know Will remembers as well. Um, you know, Silas Janzi said in front of in front of the the ACC media that that Joe Rudolph was an upgrade in their room. Didn't he call him a genius in terms of coaching? Something, something, something like, that. like that. Yeah. So all of a sudden. Now Virginia Tech just can't block. Yeah, you, and that, that and that like that's why it, it's more puzzling. It's to it's, me. it's it's inexplicable. Like Tyler Bowen was the tight ends coach at Penn State, and like seventy. I, I went back and looked up their PFF grades, and seventy five percent of them were good run blockers. And Joe Rudolph's offensive lines at Wisconsin were obviously good at run blocking, and you've got six players here for Virginia Tech that were adequate to good in run blocking. So now you combine these adequate to good players, give them an extra year in strength and conditioning, and bring in two coaches whose players in the past had never had an issue run blocking, and all of a sudden now nobody can run block. <laughs> He's had a best. It, it's true. I mean, you look back at Wisconsin – just opening holes for <laughs> Melvin Gordon and Jonathan Taylor, uh, which again, Amazing. NFL running backs. Yeah. Right. But it, it's strange it's to see all path. of this happen, uh, and we're we're looking to see what we can, what what's going to change there, especially against a, a UNC team that struggled defensively. So thank you, Katie, for that. Uh, we'll be going down to Tuscaloosa and poaching our favorite three players from Nick Saban's program. Yeah, I, <laughs> I mean, again, like like I, you know, I take a, a Hendon Hooker or. A, or Bryce Young, like I've, I mean, Jordan <laughs> Addison. Uh, you yeah. know, Jalen Hyatt was once a Virginia Tech commit, yes. now starting wide receiver for Tennessee. Yep. <laughs> there you go. Oh, I didn't know that. Maybe, yeah. for him. maybe we'll just head down 81 to Knoxville and, and grab a few. All right, we'll take our break here. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about the defense that started strong against West Virginia, but then struggled later on in the game. Also, we're going to give some flowers out to some players who had a, had a pretty good game on Thursday night. And we'll also start a new segment that we're going to have Monday mornings on the podcast looking around the ACC. All that coming up in the second half of episode 257 of the Tech Sideline Podcast. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to episode 257 of the Tech Sideline podcast. Tech Sideline brought to you by, brought to you by First Bank and Trust Company. Jake Lyman as your host on set. David Cunningham, Chris Coleman, Katie Adams in the fourth chair. Will Stewart behind the scenes. We are recapping the battle for the Black Diamond Trophy last Thursday inside Lane Stadium where West Virginia beat Virginia Tech 33-10. to We talked a lot about the offense in the first half. Let's dive into the defensive side that... Look like their same old selves early on in the game. Right off the bat, forced a three and out for West Virginia and got the offense the ball. Uh, Jalen Stroman knocked the ball out uh, from Tony Mathis Jr. and Dorian Strong fell on it. Uh, but towards the end of the game, West Virginia kind of had their way, had over 200 yards passing, over 200 yards rushing, which both surpassed the average of total yards for Virginia Tech's defense in the first three games. Uh, did you see anything different later in the game that Tech's defense did that maybe allowed West Virginia to start getting it moving? No, I think they just got worn out. Um, West Virginia had a seven had a 17-minute time of possession advantage. I think yeah. that was the difference. Um, I, and some of that is the fault of Tech's defense with those penalties. Correct, yeah. Um, some of it is, like we talked about, there was not a – strategy involved to keep the West Virginia offense on the sideline, which I, and that's going to, there has to be a strategy like that this week against UNC, but we'll talk about that more on, on Wednesday. Um, I think again, they played well early, but I think they got worn down. West Virginia's offense is big and physical. I got a 240 pound running back and you're, t- and you're on the field for 76 plays. And the longer the game o- goes on, the more you got to tackle that dude, uh, you get worn out. Um, I thought the the Tech's two biggest defensive tackles held up well. It wasn't such a good game for Pollard or Panay. And in particular, like Pollard struggled more late in the game than he did at the beginning, which which you might expect. Um, generally speaking, like the edges, edge of the defense did better. Um, the defensive tackles, like, well, not all the defensive tackles, but like Pollard and then the Mikes didn't do so well. Like... Uh, but again, like the longer the game went, the worse it got, and uh, and you can't be against a team like West Virginia that's as big and as physical as their running back is. You can't uh, can't be out there for seventy six plays unless your offense is scoring a bunch of points, which I've clearly Texas <laughs> offense is not. <laughs> I think the biggest thing is my my biggest takeaway was Virginia Tech's red zone defense is pretty good. Yep, they West Virginia got down there five times. And one of them was the final kneel down at the end of the game. Mm-hmm. But out of the other four times, three of them, tech, three times, Tech held them to a field goal. And I think that kind of goes to show you how good to Tech's defense is to, to a certain extent in those tight situations. Um, I thought the defense played pretty well, but again, not enough to you know keep the keep the Hokies in the game. But but across across the board, yes, the penalties also killed them. But if your offense helps you out a little bit more, you know, I would say it's a much better performance. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I think uh, we knew this was going to be Tech's first test, their their defense's first test. Yeah, I wouldn't say they passed it, but I wouldn't say they failed it either. Yeah, um, uh, like an incomplete. Yeah, <laughs> so, something <laughs> like that. They didn't exactly ha- they didn't have much help when it comes to to passing it because they they were kind of hung out to dry to a certain extent. Um, now I will say like. Put the shoe on the other foot. If Virginia Tech had uh, had won that game thirty three to ten, and we were one out of four scoring touchdowns and our chances in the red zone, we'd all be like, "Oh man, we could have won that game by forty or fifty yeah. if we could execute in the red zone, right?" <laughs> so it, West Virginia fans are probably saying that. Yeah, right and that's the thing. I, I think there was a lot of stuff that went on down there, but the fact that Virginia Tech, you know, if if West Virginia scores three more touchdowns. It's what like fifty something to ten, like instead of field goals. I think uh, it, it it would have been like four, maybe 40, like 40, 40 something. 40, 45. I want to tell you, I think that was West. I don't know if this is accurate or not, but as somebody said on the message boards that was big. That was West Virginia's biggest margin of victory in Blacksburg ever. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, and, and you look at it the the pick six. You take that away from the defense. So the yeah. defense yeah. gave up twenty six points, despite giving away, I think you mentioned eight first downs via penalty. So it, with all of that adversity, the number 26, if you said Tech's defense would give up 26 points, I don't think you'd feel too bad about that. I said they were going to give up 27 in my game preview. <laughs> uh, so I can't complain too much about the defense when they pretty much, I, I mean, I picked West Virginia to win, I think, 27 to 24. West Virginia scored 33, but I don't pick 
defensive scores and special team scores and things like that because yeah. they're so random. I pick what I think the opposing offense is going to be able to accomplish. And I picked them to score 27, and they scored 26. So to me, I mean, yes, the Tech defense could have played better, and they could have kept themselves off the field more w- w- without some of those penalties. But at the same time, overall, I can't complain when they pretty much gave up the amount of points that I thought they were going to give up. We knew West Virginia's offense was going to provide a much greater challenge than yeah. anybody. I mean, I think we're all learning now how bad Boston College is, aren't we? <laughs> um, and I think we're all learning now how bad uh, 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 Old Dominion is. I don't know what, what the final score of their game was, but it was 12 nothing. They were losing at halftime. Like, their offense stinks, right? And Wofford's offense stinks, and BC's offense stinks. Well, that just goes to kind of like, tell you how, how bad Virginia might be. <laughs> Considering Virginia almost lost Old Dominion, they're, they're not. They're not. Well. They're not very good. Um, but yeah, so like we knew they were going to be significantly challenged for the first time, and like I said, they didn't really pass it, but they didn't fail it either. It was a good enough performance if Tech had had a half a decent offense. Yeah. So I straight up asked Brian Pry after the game. I said, "What do you think of the defense, and did they get tired?" And he said. That's going to be an ingredient for us. We can't play too many snaps on the defensive side of the ball. Some of it was our doing. Some of it was West Virginia. Some of it was unable to move the ball better. Um, but allowing just 26 points and 400 yards against that group, you're going to give yourself a chance. And then he and then he mentioned the two drives, the two-minute one, and then the one with two personal fouls. And he said, if you come out of those two okay, you're feeling pretty good with the exception of tackling. And he said – he, you know, the tackling was not very good. He was not pleased with the tackling. Tech didn't miss a ton of tackles, but the ones they missed were critical misses. Like, yeah, yeah. like early in the game when they had him, the guy wrapped up for a loss and he broke it and ended up uh, getting a first down on third down. And then they went down and kicked a field goal, ended up being a long drive. Like yeah. Tech would have gotten the ball back around midfield. Yeah. So it wasn't like they were out there missing a ton of tackles, but the ones they did miss were, were critical misses. Yeah. And I think, I think as a whole, the defense was okay. About as good as you, maybe, maybe you could expect a little bit better. Um, obviously the, the penalties, you know, when you have two captains commit two 15 yard penalties on the same drive, that's kind of killer. Um, if you get out of that drive, you're looking a little bit better. So I, all things considered, you know, not bad. I would say a little bit above average, but um, you know, the defense showed it can hang around, and I think I think that's important because it's probably going to be that way for a lot of games this year. Big test coming up next week against North Carolina, who all they know is offense. Uh, and <laughs> we talked about the penalties, and we haven't mentioned the one with the most lasting effects. Jalen Stroman uh, called for targeting. targeting late in the game, and he so will miss the first half of that game against, against North Carolina. a high power passing. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and he's he's the nickel. Well, he's not the nickel, but he comes into the game in the nickel safety. situations, right? Yeah. So that means Tech has to change their. Not entire defensive well, game plan. I, you but who, you plug in. That role you now? probably plug in Nike Hawkins. Is my guess. I guess. Um, um, yeah. So so in nickel situations, Tremari Connor slides up from safety to nickelback, mm-hmm. and then they bring in Jalen Stroman at safety. Well, Tech's gonna be playing a lot of nickel against North Carolina, yeah. and Jalen Stroman's not yeah. going to be available for. Stroman's had a good year. He's he done has, a good yeah. job for Tech in that role. He's played a lot. He hadn't started a game, but he's done a good job in that role. Was it him that forced a fumble? Yes. I yes. thought so. Yeah. yeah, and Dorian Strong recovered. So, yeah. yeah, I've been, like, again, Tech forced a couple big plays. Um, I, I was I was surprised that Tech didn't get more pressure, but I, I think when you're playing, an off, like, that offensive line of West Virginia is pretty good. That, when West Virginia, the vast majority of their passes, they get them out of there pretty quick. Yeah, too. like they're, they're not. He's got a, he's JC Daniels has a quick release. They're not. They, he does, and 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 just their whole offense is set up. I think where they're not going to get sacked very much. Yep. Yeah, I believe Taiwan Garbett did get one. Sack. He got he got one. No, it was forced by Jaden Keller. I yes. saw that on the uh, yeah. on the condensed version. He blitzed and kind of forced Daniels to scramble into Garbett. And mentioning Jaden Keller, I want to give some flowers out to some guys who played pretty well. I thought Keller showed up a lot more in that game. We started to see maybe why the coaching staff was so high on him. The wheels graded out better in this game. And and Jaden McDonald only got five snaps. It was uh, Keller and Lawson played a lot. Yeah. And they hung in there. Um, they, they did they did it like like I said, it was the it was more the interior of Tech's defense than no. than, than I know Kelly Lawson's second. kicking himself for not recovering that punt. I know he is. Yeah. So that was on a special teams play. He's he, I'm sure he is. I mean it happens. Like he's certainly not the only tech player that yeah. has been a, unable to come up with like a 
game changing type play over the last few years. So, but, but he's got a great future. Yeah, I mean he's he's long and he's athletic. I think he plays more physically than you would think with his size. So he just needs to, you know. I, I think he made good progress in his first year. Put on fifteen pounds in his red shirt year. Now put on another ten or fifteen in this next year. And you know, gradually build yourself into a very good player. But he's got that ability. And I know we've we've been talking defense, but we we didn't really talk about Caleb Smith. He made the great catch for the yeah. touchdown and five catches for seventy yards. I was talking That's career, about career high yardage. Yeah, yeah. And I, I was talking about it during the game that he's kind of evolved as a player. Last year and the year before, it felt like he was a guy. You need five yards on third and four. He's going to run a hitch route. You hit him. That's that's what he did. Now yeah. it, he's a deep threat. Now he's he, a guy who can go make plays for and you. He, and early on the first drive, he made a man miss on that crossing pattern yeah. and leaned forward to get the first down. Yeah, so he's a more complete football player now. Again, he was the high grader on offense. Yeah, I feel like last year he was more of a safety valve. Yeah. Like yeah. like when, you, when, when you're scrambling around and you need an option. He was big in that West Virginia game last year. Exactly. Where a, a ton of third down conversions. Now he's the go-to option, and um, that that catch, the way he was able to adjust himself, like he's looking over his left shoulder, and then he like changed positions in the air and caught it on the right side. I was really impressed. I think he's gotten better. He's you know he's a clear starter at wide receiver and their most productive player. Who should be the other two starting wide receivers is is the question. Um, we haven't seen much out of Flofton. <sighs> We haven't. Now, he, him and Gosnell are the two highest graders on the team in run blocking. Wow. Um, wow. So, like, if you want any kind of competent run blocking on the field, they kind of <laughs> have to be out there, right? But the thing is, they're not – they haven't – like, I would play Christian Moss to make the passing game better. Yeah. I mean, uh, he would be one of my three starters, and I don't know, figure out the third. Blue, maybe? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> well, well, let's wrap up West Virginia discussion with kind of some big picture stuff. What does this loss mean for Virginia Tech? There's no games on the schedule between Tech and West Virginia for a while, so it seems like the Black Diamond Trophy is going to stay in Morgantown for the foreseeable future. Uh, and now the ACC schedule gets into full swing and Tech's schedule gets tough. Can they keep this season from going into a, a tailspin with you know UNC, Pitt, Miami, NC State all coming down the road? You know, the thing is, like, if you look at, the, first of all, West Virginia, it sucks losing that game. Yeah. It's, not, well, it's, not, it's not losing the game per se. It's just you know you don't have another chance. Yes. Because, look, when you play in a rivalry game with another big state school that really supports football and football is important to them as an institution, as a fan base, you're going to lose some of those games. That's the way it goes. But you're but also going to get it back. You have a chance to get it back. Like if Tech lost to UVA, that would suck, but at least see they, get it, they get it. See you next year. Yeah. Get it back next year, yeah. right? Uh, you might may never get a chance for West Virginia again, and I think that's a shame. Considering the ratings the game got, I think the uh, yeah, ESPN should be pushing those schools into, into playing that game yeah. every year, but we'll see if that happens. Um, as far as the immediate future, if you look at October, I think um, if you look at each game on a micro level, like Tech's going to be an underdog in every single one of them. Yeah. They're nine-point dogs against UNC right now. That's the early line. Um, and they'll be an underdog in the others, too. So, like, if you look at each of those individual matchups, I'm not probably not going to pick Virginia Tech to win any of them. Now, if you look at it in the macro, is it likely that they lose five straight games? Like, North Carolina is very beatable. I, I don't know if you all watched that game on Saturday. Yeah. But their defense is just – their defense can look good, really good for two or three straight plays, and then the next play they give up 30-yard chunk play. Yeah. They're, they're just they have no discipline no discipline and Miami and, did not look good this weekend right either. right exactly yeah. at one point the uh the sideline reporter in the UNC Notre Dame game did a report from the sideline saying that people were on the sideline on defense for Carolina throwing clipboards and pointing fingers and the coaches had to come over and tell the defensive players to stop being selfish so that tells you all about North Carolina, their football program, their defense, everything, right? They actually remind me of like the 2003 tech defense down the stretch when guys were playing selfishly and not for the team. And, you know, your five-star corners out there punching guys in the helmet during the game. It was just, just awful, undisciplined program. I don't know why anybody would want to play defense there. <laughs> tech can win that game. They're a mentally tougher team yeah. than North Carolina. Yep. If you challenge North Carolina and make them face adversity, they will fold just like they did last year. Uh, but at the same time, they're so explosive on offense that if Tech gets off to a bad start and UNC gets up 14 nothing, it's over. Yep. Yeah, It's over. And, and we, then, obviously, we, Miami, 
you know you don't know which Miami t- what Miami team is going to show up. I mean, Middle Tennessee lost to James Madison by 38, and then they won on the road at Miami by two touchdowns. Miami goes down the field. It's fourth and one on the one yard line. They get stopped by Middle Tennessee on the one, and then they give up a 99 yard touchdown pass. <laughs> That's so Miami, right? <laughs> so Tech could win either one of those games, but at the same time, like. At some point, they gotta they gotta do something on offense, yeah, right? Yeah. Like they can't score. Like West Virginia's defense had gotten trounced by their two Power Five teams they faced, and then all of a sudden look like the '86 Bears against Tech. <laughs> so North Carolina's defense is bad, but so was West Virginia's. Yeah, and and it didn't help. So my guess is that like Carolina's defense will look better than it's looked this year against Tech. I do think the Tech offense will look better than it's looked against UNC. I think they'll kind of cancel each other out. So I how many explosive plays does the Tech defense allow? That, that'll be what decides the game. How, you know, but turnovers. Can, I, can Tech's defense yeah. force a turnover like like Jalen Strowman yeah, did? That, right. The and, Doran and Strong fumble recovery. Exactly. And so – I think I'm inclined to think the Tech will win one of those games. I just don't know which one because I just think, oh, law of averages, right? I don't think they're going to lose five in a row. Now, that being said, they could because that offense is so bad. Like, I'm going to end up picking against them on all four of those games. Hey, me too. Yeah. I think we're all tied up now, right, Will? I think we are. We are. I think so. Um, I was just going to point out ESPN PR's tweet uh, on Saturday. 1.6 1.6 million viewers for yeah. Virginia Tech, West Virginia. Uh, from 9 to 9.15, it peaked at nearly 2 million. Um, it's the second most, non, uh, second most uh, non-week most non one Thursday game on ESPN since 2017. Right. So, yeah. I, People I, like to watch that game. Somebody's going to make it happen to make that game they yeah. better start yeah. to happen a little more often. Yeah, for the rest of the season, Jake, to your question, I would say, uh, again, a lot just comes down to the, the offensive game plan. And, and one of the things that stood out to me, and I don't know if Tyler Bowen would necessarily be joking around about this anymore. Um, so last week when we, we chatted with him uh, and we asked him, I think it was Aaron McFarling of the Roanoke Times, asked Tyler Bowen with, with West Virginia's you know high-powered offense, explosive offense, and the tempo they play at, does that, uh, you know, how do you adjust your game plan? Do you adjust your game plan? Does that, that factor in? And he jokingly said, they have an offense? <laughs> He's like, I've only been watching the defense. And then he went on to say, you know, yes, of course we're taking it into account, but didn't really give an answer. But how Virginia Tech manages the situation offensively, what plays Tech runs, um, it seems like Virginia Tech is very vanilla in the run game offensively. And maybe that's what you have to be right now with how bad the run blocking is. But I'm just, I'm just surprised that everything's an inside zone or outside zone. It's like, it's nothing, nothing special. And you get into third and long every single, every single drive. Somebody texted me on Saturday and said the the offense looks like a spring game running game with the simplicity of it. And I agree with that because, you know, so many spring games are on TV these days. So coaches don't want to give anything away. So they stick to the basics in the spring game. And yeah, that is kind of what Tech's running game looks like. It looks like a spring game running game as far as the variety of types of runs and things like that. It just doesn't seem overly complex. Yeah. And I think I, I would expect, I mean, I would hope Tyler Bowen, you know, starts to be more creative, but also Tech needs to, you know, Grant Wells can manage games. Tech needs to kind of go into a little bit of game management mode. And when you play a North Carolina team, Mm -hmm. you cannot have a 17-minute time of possession difference. No, that'll be ugly Uh, again. I mean, it was ugly this week. It'll be ugly against them, too, if that happens. So you have to go into this game. To me, this is the same game as last year, except it's in Chapel Hill. You have to go into that game with a specific mindset. Like, not to say, oh, here's how many points we need to score to win. Here's what we need to do offensively in terms of helping out the defense and managing the game yeah. to win the game. And we'll have a full preview of North Carolina on Wednesday, dive into all this stuff a little bit more, but very similar game to West Virginia in terms of the high powered offense, lacking a little on defense when it comes to the Tar Heels. Uh, we are going to look around the ACC to finish up the podcast, but let's check in with Katie one more time in the fourth chair before we do. 
I think I'm just going to let you guys get into that ACC discussion because I think it'll probably be a little lengthy with, you know, every coastal team losing this weekend except for Pitt. I was going to mention <laughs> that Miami oh, game, man. which Chris talked about right. already a little bit. I mean, crazy to bench your starting quarterback against Middle Tennessee of all teams. And, and a guy who was really good for him last year. Yeah, yeah Tyler Van Dyke. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely feel a little bit better about pulling off the Miami upset, quote-unquote, um, <laughs> with their struggles in that one. But, yeah, I think y'all should just go ahead and get into that. Okay. Well, well let's do it. We're going to, to start. Over the next couple of weeks, Mondays, we're going to get Chris and David to give us their ACC power rankings, go up and down the entire conference and see kind of how things change week to week. Uh, and I, I know we talked about it a little bit, uh, very Atlantic heavy at the top, uh, but let, let's start at the bottom. Uh, who you got? Who do you guys have in the cellar of the ACC? You just want to go like back and forth? Yeah, yeah let's go back yeah. and forth here. Uh, 14. Uh, Georgia Tech, who just fired... Jeff Collins and the uh, their athletic director. Uh, yes, they did. And I actually have Boston College 14th. Mm. And the reason the reason I, I, is because Georgia Tech just fired their head coach. I actually think, think Georgia Tech had a better, better weekend yeah. than yeah. Boston College. You know so I've got Georgia Tech 13th and Boston College 14th. So you, are you I've guys, got Boston College 13th. So you guys are yeah. just flipped there 14, 13. Here we go at 12. I, I can see Chris's. <laughs> I don't see David's. What, David, who do you have at 12? Virginia Tech. Virginia, Virginia Tech. Yeah, that's who Chris has too. Not great. I have, I have Virginia at 11. Uh, so do I. Okay, so similar 10? Ten, ten? No, no, 8, 9, 10 is, it, 7, 8, 9, 10 is kind, kind of where I think it'll, it'll yeah. mess up. I have Miami at 10. I have Louisville at 10. Okay. I have Louisville at 9. I have Miami 9. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Flip-flopping. Which is wild to say that, that Duke... Duke, like I've got Duke at eight. Me Duke, too. first year, first year head coach Mike Elko. This they lost to Kansas. They were but in that Kansas, game. Kansas, Kansas, Kansas is yeah. good. Can, was, Kansas is four and it was the Blue Blood Bowl is what they yeah. call it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it's it's crazy that like a handful of basketball schools are undefeated. Kansas is four and zero. Syracuse and Virginia Tech four and zero. ACC in basketball. What is this world we're living in? <laughs> Dude, uh, I've I've got Pitt at seven. I've got UNC at seven. Okay, I've got Carolina at six. I've got Syracuse at six. Oh, so he, here we get into the top ten. I mentioned it's Atlantic heavy. David said his top five are all in the oh, Atlantic. Atlantic. I can see that the, high, top the highest coastal four. team I have is North Carolina at six. I've got Pitt at five. So okay. that's my highest. Coastal so there we go. Team. I've got I've got Florida State at five. And I, Florida State surprised me. Beat BC by thirty this weekend. Well, Boston College I, is not again. Very Boston College not very good, but still. But yeah, I, I'm. I'm you know, I, I beginning of the year I thought that the LSU game was not necessarily a fluke, but how good is LSU? But Florida State has looked okay. But well, they look like a well coached team now. Yeah, yeah, they look like a team that's actually responding to coaching now. Well, yeah. let's talk about the very top of this thing. I think in some order, you guys have Wake up there, NC State up there, and Clemson up there. Uh, Clemson Wake this weekend was a, a thriller. I mean, Clemson went up 14 nothing early. Wake battled back, two overtime game. Clemson came out on top. I, I think both those teams proved that they're worthy of being a ranked oh, yeah. team in the ACC. I thought that was a great game. Clemson almost waited too long to switch to that too high safety look. Um, because they could not stop Wake's receivers, yeah. their quarterback, when when they left their corners on islands. I mean, Wake was going to win that game by probably 10 or so if Clemson hadn't made that change. But when they made that change, they they made it a game of one-on-one, -on -one, man versus man, talent versus talent, their defensive line versus Wake's offensive line. Yeah. And Clemson's always going to win that battle. Yeah. Um, so, But it took them three quarters too long to, to make that change and which gave wake a chance to win the football game. But it's funny, like uh, my top four all play each other this week. Yeah. So it's like the semifinals of like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I will. I so I've got Syracuse at four. I've uh, got, cause you, you have Florida state there. Uh, the reason I don't want to wreck Syracuse as high is they're barely skating by these games. That's so, true. So yeah, uh, they easily could have lost the last two weeks. Right. right. Yeah. Well, uh, I will say they've got so they got Wagner this week. Wagner <laughs> <laughs> lost like no, that was Warner. Oh, a little bit different. Different. Okay. Uh, okay. Ninety-eight to nothing. The game you're yeah, talking yeah, about. Yeah. <laughs> that that yeah. wasn't Wagner. Okay, not Wagner. Okay. Uh, uh, no, but I but Syracuse is Wagner this week, and then they've got NC State next week. So Syracuse should be five and zero. Oh, uh, Going into a home game against NC State, which, I mean, the the Atlantic Division is looking pretty good. So I've got Wake fourth. I've got Wake third. Okay. I've got Florida State third. Oh, yeah. So I had Florida State at five. Um, and then I assume Clemson, NC State one, two. I've got 
Yeah, I've got Clemson one and NC State too. Yeah, that's what I've got. And they play this weekend. And that yeah. college game day is there. That's going to be a yeah. really fun game. Yeah, uh, and NC State, after a little bit of a shaky start to the season, if ECU had a kicker, they would have been 0-1. Uh, they, they've they <laughs> yeah. started to look a lot better too, so I'm excited for that one this weekend. That's a top 10 matchup. NC State's number 10 in the, in the updated AP poll. Oh, really? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so, and I, I was thinking about this yesterday. <laughs> Virginia Tech next year, we start the the new ACC scheduling model. Virginia Tech's teams that they get to play every year, Virginia Pitt and uh, Wake Forest, and Wake Forest looks awfully good. Yeah, but they're going to lose that quarterback after this year. Yes, but, but they are. They're extremely well coached. But team. yes, yeah. a very well coached get, team. Get, get the most out of the talent that yeah. they have. You yeah. Know? yeah, yeah, and you're right, Chris. The, your top four all play each other, so it's going to be. We'll, we'll see how it all shuffles out next Monday when, when we go through this again. Uh, but you're hoping Tech moves up from 12 a little bit. Maybe if they can they can pull off the upset in Chapel Hill. <laughs> Maybe yeah, get back yeah, into the middle up. of the pack. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, again, it's a, what's a, it's a, what's a, what have you done for me lately kind of thing. Correct. Yeah, yeah that's um, exactly. It, but, yeah, you know, I, I do think it's interesting. Like, Carolina is an eight-point favorite. And, and if I – or they were – when they opened an eight-point favorite, I think it, it moved Might to nine. Might have moved to nine, yeah. Yeah. Um, if I was a better, yeesh. I wouldn't bet if I was a better because I don't <laughs> trust tech offense. But at the same time, I wouldn't trust UNC at all either. Yeah. That people were asking me like Wednesday, like, what do you think about Tech plus one and a half or West Virginia minus one and a half? I was like, I have no idea what's going to happen. In this yeah, game. you know that like, was that was it was interesting. <laughs> like, so Wednesday, Wednesday I was walking home from the gym and I ran into a former Tech football player who's he's one of the most positive people I know about life, about football, everything. And he comes up to me and goes, man, we're going to get blown out tomorrow. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm shocked to hear you say that of all people. Yeah. And then Brandon Patterson sent his his preview and he picked Tech to win. He said, I'm going to pick with my heart and pick Tech to win. But then he said, if I pick with my brain, I'd probably pick West Virginia by a few scores. So like, yeah. I, I think it was it, just looking back and. I think of every bunch of people made emotional picks last week. Yeah, I think I made an emotional pick just having it as close as I did, because there was no evidence going into that game that Tech's offense could do anything. And yeah, I think I think I was still. I mean, I can't speak for Will. Will pick Tech too. I think I was still kind of holding out hope that Tech's offense would. Yeah, like, you know, yeah. I think you're holding out hope. And and again, like you mentioned earlier, this was the first true test. You know what Virginia Tech's offense is. Like, this yeah. is the baseline, and you hope it goes up, but until you see change, this is what you're going to get. Right yeah. now, like, like the running game has not improved at all, so you kind of you are what you are now, and I'm going to need to see evidence of it improving before I think that it will, right? Yeah. Before I pick, pick it to improve, so... I will say it was pretty cool to see uh, the men's basketball team get their uh, championship. What about that whole atmosphere? On ju- Justin Mutz just, leading the Let's Go I mean, Hokies yeah. before Enter Sandman. And, until you know the third quarter, what a, what a, what a great day! Yeah, right. Um, yeah. The tailgating scene was awesome. The crowd was great. Enter Sandman was amazing. The fireworks display was yeah. fantastic. I wore my "Breathe If You Hate West Virginia" shirt to the game. So many people, including West Virginia fans, wanted their picture taken with me in that shirt. <laughs> yeah, and all the West That's Virginia awesome. fans were really nice. All the ones we tailgated with. Uh, so it was a really nice day until the third quarter. Yeah. Weather held off. I mean, like that clear skies. Well, it kind of did. Like I parked. As soon as I parked and got out of my car and started walking to my tailgate, it started pouring rain. So I had to oh, do the really? first half of my tailgate. Yeah, I, I guess it did close. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's crazy to think three weeks in a row with home games. Now we're halfway done with the home schedule, yeah. uh, but but still some fun ones coming up. Miami, Georgia Tech, UVA are the the last yeah. three we've got. So, uh, looking forward to that, and also UNC preview coming up on Wednesday. Uh, before we get out of here, Katie, any good questions in the YouTube chat? Yeah, I'll do a couple of questions, but breaking as of two minutes ago, the time was announced for the pick game. So it's the exact same as this weekend, three thirty p.m. on ACC Network. Wonderful. Three thirty is the best. Especially for road games, I think. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you can, you don't have, you can do what you need to do in the morning and early afternoon. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 and then you're and, done and by you seven. Stu- what, you can what still network. watch games that night. Yep. 
Is it ACC Network? Yeah, it's ACC Network. Wonderful. And then that Florida State at NC State matchup is a night game, which Ooh, I cannot wait to watch. So as soon as our game's nice. over, I'll be tuning into that probably. <laughs> um, but to get into the questions, um, Andrew Cyback asked, do we not run quarterback sneaks under center because the offensive line is bad or because Wells isn't used to being under center? That's a good question. Um, you do look around college football and you see other teams running quarterback sneaks from under center, but this is the second offensive coaching staff that apparently doesn't at Virginia Tech, who apparently doesn't believe in quarterback sneaks from, from under center. Yeah. So I don't know the answer to that. I, I do know, like, you recruit some quarterbacks these days, and depending on the high school system they played in, they may have never taken a snap from under center, ever. So it might be something you have to completely re- retrain them to do. Um, uh, I'll be honest, I would prefer it. Probably, but at the same time, if you line up a quarterback under center, you know exactly what's coming for the most part. Uh, so I guess, but at the same time, you don't want to overthink it. Uh, I would say my biggest takeaway right now is I don't think it matters whether he's under center or lined up in shotgun or lined up in pistol or whatever formation. That fourth and one play, Tex offensive line got pushed three yards into the backfield. So it doesn't matter where he's lined up in that yeah. play. Like They just got to get better up front. On paper, like if, if like I knew the tech offensive line could block, and I knew they needed to get less than a yard, I would prefer. And they were going to run it with the quarterback. I I would prefer it to be from under center. Yeah. But I, I think I think there are issues that need to be solved before. Yeah. Before that question, yeah. like actually, like holds relevance. I think it's interesting. I saw um, uh, some I, I saw it on Twitter. Some like Penn State writer chimed in. Um, somebody had tweeted, I think it was Mike McDaniel had tweeted out, um, or had like quote tweeted a video of that fourth and one play, um, because everybody was making fun of it. Like, you know, you're running fourth and one from the shotgun and some Penn state writer replied and said something along the lines of, it was a play that they frequented at Penn state and it worked. But my guess is Penn state had a better offensive line and, Imagine what can work when you block people. <laughs> Jeez, yeah. we don't need to get into that. <laughs> Let's get one more question if you're yelling. Um, Steve Bryce has a question for David. How many losses in a row in October before we just start playing the young guys that'll be back for the 2023 and 2024 seasons? It'll give them meaningful minutes instead of redshirting. I hope it wouldn't get that bad. I, You know, part of it is that, like, you look at the defense and – there's so like the like it's just really on the offensive line you know and and if because you've got guys like Taiwan Garbett, Josh Fuga, Nor- Norrell Pollard, Mario Kendricks that have played pretty well um Dorian Strong like I feel like a lot of the veterans on the defensive side have been good and I would say like a guy like Caleb Smith has been pretty good you know Grant Wells has been okay he could be better obviously I think again the issue just comes down to the offensive line. Now I'd I'd be curious how how bad is are the young guys up front then? How bad are, are Xavier Chaplin, a Braylon Moore who played for the first time this weekend? He's number ninety eight. Yeah, he got a yeah, couple yeah. snaps because they put him in like a jumbo, jumbo set. Yeah, tied in. Um, you know I I don't think they it would get that bad, um, just because a lot of the veterans are are pretty good. And I think if you fix the issues up front up front on the offensive line. This is a team that that could hang around and win a couple games here or there. Um, or be an average football team. Um, I don't think it would get that bad to that point just because they're the veterans on this football team. A lot of them have been through a lot. And for the most part, you know, you take out the offensive line, I think the veterans across the board have played pretty well. So I wouldn't expect that to happen. But I do think, like, you know, it's going to be interesting when you get to a game like Liberty and it's, you know, how much do you play those young guys, the guys that are still going to be able to redshirt? Yeah, um, you just basically described Virginia Tech as a better Boston College. Yeah. Which is very much what Tech is. They're yeah. a better version of Boston College. Um, if it comes down to, to the month of November, remember you got four games to play, guys. Um I don't want to burn any red shirts this year that we don't have to. Yeah. Because red shirting and, and getting time in the weight room 
Like I want to. I don't want. I don't want to go. Right now, we look like a four-win football. There's team no to point I'll in be sacrificing red shirts to win for a fifth game when you're going to win four. Right? Yes. You know, uh, it just doesn't make any sense. Always look out when you're in a rebuilding situation like Virginia Tech. You need to make the best long-term decisions Correct. with your personnel, and I think it would be a disservice to those guys and a disservice to the long-term future of the program to to just start pulling red shirts left and right. Yeah. Um, uh, I also think like. There are a lot of hardworking guys in, in this program, and uh, everybody wants to uh, let's play freshman, right? Well, when you play freshman, you got to take away playing time from somebody. So, like you want to play, you want to play that freshman wide receiver. Well, that snaps have those snaps have to come away from somebody. So it means you're taking your junior wide receiver out of the game even though he doesn't really deserve it. You're doing it just to play the freshman because people all like that. It yeah. makes everybody feel warm and fuzzy. Well, then that junior receiver gets pissed and transfers, right? <laughs> so, yeah. uh, nah, just build it how it's supposed to be built. Build it for the long term. Um, yeah. I, it seems to me, like, if he hadn't put any of those backup offensive linemen in at this point, like the true freshman, then he's trying to redshirt. Yeah. Um, and if somebody gets hurt and you need them in November, if you don't play them now – that, and they like had to play in the a last guy, four games. A guy like, they Xavier, still a guy like right. Xavier Chaplin, right. yeah. exactly. Um, so from that standpoint, I'd rather save it to the end because you still have the option. You can play them, but you can still redshirt them too. As opposed, if you play them right now, and then you need end up needing them in November, then that redshirt option's off the table. Yeah, I think there's a big difference between a, a guy like Bryce Duke because he's clearly able to make an impact. He's physically ready. Yes. And I know Will's having a man crush over there. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's smiling. Um, and then there's a difference with Xavier Chaplin, a guy who Joe Rudolph clearly does not think is ready mm-hmm. yet. Like Braylon Moore, four games in, just got his first like snap, and yeah. it was in a jumbo package. So. I, I still find that a little bit of an odd situation. Like before the season, Pry was like basically like, oh, Braylon Moore, yeah, he's going to play significant snaps in the first game. And he's just getting his first two career snaps against West Virginia yeah. as a tight as a jumbo tight end wearing number ninety eight. Yeah. So uh, it almost seems like that something happened like late in August where everybody just hit a wall. Like like so the starting offensive line hasn't improved. Braylon Moore, who looked like they said he was going to play a lot, must have hit a wall because he's not playing. So it's just kind of an odd situation to me. Well, well, did you break the red shirt button holding it down for so long during that conversation? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's Chris's favorite topic right there is uh, is red shirting. Uh, I want to thank everybody in the chat for those questions. Thank you for Katie for bringing those to us. Uh, I think that's going to about wrap things up here on episode 257 of the Tech Sideline podcast. But before we get out of here, both of you, what, what's coming up on Tech Sideline over the next few days? Uh, I should have a Brandon Patterson article breaking down that wonderful game that I'm sure everybody can't wait to read. <laughs> Uh, normal week of content. We'll have our preview and podcast on Wednesday. I'll have an inside the numbers on Thursday. We'll see what my topic is. And there's normal, normally scheduled interviews this week. Yeah, I haven't heard anything um, from Virginia Tech, but that I assume means regular week. Press conference with Pry on Tuesday and a player. Uh, may I don't know if they'll open practice, but um, Brent Pry after practice with a couple players on Wednesday and then an assistant coach on Thursday, I think, unless they put them on Wednesday. But, yeah, normal week. Um, yeah, I mean – North Carolina, you know, obviously, I guess this is the first. This is the first time in a couple of weeks, you know, I've been traveling on the road. So, you know, I'll be in Chapel Hill, um, back to back weeks on the road. But you know what? After after being here for so long, <laughs> and this was kind of like an, a nice extended weekend. Like, got to relax a little bit on Friday, yeah. Saturday, Sunday. So, yeah, ba- back to our normal schedule. Uh, last week we did the Tuesday hybrid podcast, but. Monday morning, and we'll be back Wednesday uh, with the preview of North Carolina. Uh, That'll wrap things up here on episode 257 of the Tech Sideline podcast. Want to thank all of you for tuning in and thank everybody on set. Across the way, managing editor David Cunningham at The Real D. Cunna on Twitter. Chris Coleman, lead analyst and columnist for Tech Sideline. He's at Chris Coleman TSL on Twitter. Katie Adams did a great job in the fourth chair. Once again, she'll be back hosting on Wednesday at Katie Six Adams on Twitter. And behind the scenes, our best podcast producer in the land. Will Stewart, also the founder and general manager of Tech Sideline. You can find him at Will Stewart TSL on Twitter. And I'm Jake Lyman, your host, signing off. Have a great start to your week, Hokies fans. We'll talk to you on Wednesday.